First uh, event, my first speaking event uh, after surgery, not very long ago. I apologize, I'm, you're going to have to it's okay. not see very well over there. Um, and so you'll have to forgive me because uh, I don't know, has anybody ever seen me speak before? A few people? Uh, I'm not going to be my normal gregarious self here. It's a combination of narcotics, pain, <laughs> and accidents. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any of you who have been injured will know. Uh, what I mean by that, but uh, you know, this is this is a great uh, time to talk to you guys because we're celebrating the 20th anniversary uh, of Linux this year, and uh, you know, arguably this past year has been the best year uh, ever for Linux. Uh, although each year really becomes better for Linux, so every year really is the best year for Linux because it's been sequentially just becoming more and more successful, really across every form of computing. But uh, I thought I would just get it out of the way to start with so that you guys can understand what happened. So I engage in dangerous sports. Uh, if anybody here from the US remembers Joe Theismann, uh, the uh, leg break that he had, this is yep. essentially my tibia fibia. Uh, I broke it uh, while skiing down a steep mountain. I was trying to come up with a formula to show, you know, I figured you guys would be, uh, understand uh, the formula for what happened to me in, in more clearly than just the picture here. But what really happened is when one's perceived ability to ski is exceeded <laughs> by one's actual ability to ski, this, this is the result. And so, uh, unfortunately, I shattered my leg. Uh, and uh, the good news is they've repaired me. I'm better, faster, and stronger now. But uh, don't be behind me in the airport security line. That's my only <laughs> warning to all of you guys. But speaking of airport security, I think it's a good example of where uh, Linux has become really successful and, uh, and just how prolific Linux as an overall platform has become. And I want to share a few examples of just, which will remind you guys, and many of you may know this, but will remind you just how important and pervasive Linux has become in everyone's lives. You know, Linux runs air traffic control systems over much of Europe uh, and North America. It, it, literally, your life uh, is in the hands of the Linux platform, which is scary to think, but uh, it is indeed true. Uh, it runs nuclear submarines, so uh, if there's problems there, we also have a life-threatening situation. Linux is uh, at the heart of you know, some of the most cutting edge research in the world right now. It uh, powers the uh, CERN Super Collider. Uh, more importantly, it uh, created all the digital effects for Avatar, which I think is probably more important. I, in fact, I, I suspect the computing system, which is down in New Zealand, is probably more powerful than the, uh, the system they have here at CERN. But that actually may be true. I'm going to have to go check that out. Um, Linux also uh, you know, powers the uh, majority of global equity trading in, in the world. So if you think about it, your life is in Linux hands, your uh, finances are in Linux hands. It's just crazy to think of how important Linux has become in the daily uh, lives of people all over the world. Just a fun statistic for you guys to think of. Today, we, we went and looked at all the world's global equity exchanges that publicly report uh, what operating platform they run on. Some of them, for security reasons, don't report what they actually use. Uh, but what we could confirm, and I think this is probably underestimating, is that 72% of uh, global equities trade on the Linux platform. That, that is trillions and trillions of dollars that transact every year uh, on Linux. So uh, hardly a hobbyist effort when you consider that uh, context. Uh, not only is Linux dominating financial services and uh, uh, the global economy in terms of the global economy running on it, but um, Linux is also dominating. Let me try and adjust this here. Uh, Linux is also dominating in the uh, supercomputing uh, world of high performance computing. In just 10 years, Linux has completely unseated every other platform in the world of supercomputing, which is just amazing. 
uh, and how short a period of time Linux has come to dominate this important area of computing. And, and I find this interesting, but what I find more interesting is just the amount of power uh, that has resulted from uh, the utilization of Linux in these much more affordable, uh, massively parallel, high-performance computing systems. If you just look at the total gigaflops per second in terms of raw compute power that Linux enables, it's just skyrocketed uh, over the past decade as well. Uh, and we're seeing now Linux really expand in this area, not just into you know uh, the sort of normal uh, high-performance computing running scientific systems and things like that, but we're seeing more sort of exotic architectures like the Watson uh, supercomputer that you may have seen uh, beat uh, the uh, two other guys in Jeopardy. Uh, by the way, those two guys could have won if they had just asked uh, or had the answer be, how do you format a Linux hard drive? <laughs> <laughs> they would just, they could have won. Uh, Watson would have formatted himself. Uh, but uh, as you can see, you, you know, not only are we, we enabling a lot more power here, uh, but these exotic ar architectures that are engaging in rich analytics or natural language processing and so forth are really on the cutting edge of new types of computing that I think are really going to change uh, the way we live. They're going to change the way we manage, uh, you know, traffic, the environment, and other things. And I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg in these very exotic HPC systems that are all powered by Linux. But it's not just in high performance computing where Linux is dominating. Uh, it's also taken the lead in uh, embedded systems. And this is about a, a year and a half old statistic, and uh, uh, I actually have to swap out for uh, this uh, the, the latest round of these statistics as soon as I get permission to do so. We respect copyright. Uh, and uh, but what you can see is that in embedded systems, Linux is also the fastest growing platform uh, of any other platform out there in computing. <coughs> Uh, Linux is also really dominating in the mobile device market. Uh, and, you know, it's in a variety of forms. And I just have highlighted a few examples of where in the uh, smartphone arena, uh, Linux is dominating in the mobile device market. Obviously, Android is where we see uh, really massive uh, change in uh, the mobile device landscape with Linux powering that. But we're also seeing a huge sea change in the mobile device uh, marketplace through things like WebOS. Uh, I uh, attended a, an event a few uh, weeks ago, I think it was about a month ago, where HP announced their new WebOS products, their new tablet, and their new phones. And uh, which, by the way, are, are, are spectacular devices. Uh, if you get a chance to play with them, they're, they're loads of fun. Uh, and the event itself was really interesting. But what I found most interesting at that event was that HP announced that WebOS will ship on every HP device, including their PC. Uh, lineup. So really, you're going to see Linux in all of HP's printers, all of HP's PCs. I mean, here you have the world's largest PC manufacturer now announcing that they're essentially shipping a Linux desktop uh, with every single PC they make. And you know, they sort of hem and haw about how well it, you know, will be uh, it'll be a dual boot type of a situation. Well, we'll see how long that lasts. Um, and I'll give you <coughs> an explanation for that and for why I'm very, very bullish for uh, a Linux desktop and a Linux client in the future. Uh, what's also interesting to note here that may, many of you may not be aware of um, in terms of Linux and the mobile device marketplace is uh, virtually every major device OEM that I speak to is not only shipping probably a Linux device, either with Android or one of the mainstream Linux uh, uh, mobile platforms. But they almost all tend to have some kind of Skunk Works project where they're working on some, you know, Mata, I guess, is sort of a more public example of where Samsung has you know, their own uh, widget framework that they're uh, running on top of Linux as well. But uh, what, I, what I want to point out to you here is I think that these are just early examples. I think Android is a, a big, big player here and will continue to be a big player. But I think that we're at the first five minutes of a very long game in the mobile device uh, platform landscape. Uh, and uh, <coughs> certainly, we're going to see a lot of change there uh, as well. And the mobile client, I sincerely uh, tell you, will change and, and is a wide open playing field. I think one example I would give to you to, to hammer that point home even further is that today, 
Apple, which is you know one of the most significant uh, success stories in, in technology, arguably the most uh, successful technology company in the world, uh, you know 60% or more, I think it's almost 70% of their revenue comes from products that did not exist uh, three years ago. Uh, many of those products didn't exist even you know a couple of years ago. So that's how rapidly uh, we're seeing change in the uh, mobile device landscape. And I don't I, I don't <laughs> expect that to change. I think that it will be very, very dynamic. And I'm going to give you some examples here of where I think uh, that will head in general. Um, one other point I wanted to make about the success of Linux is just to point out that even the stock market agrees with uh, how well Linux is doing as a platform. Uh, this is, uh, wow, that did not turn out well at all. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I have to redo this. <coughs> this is a snapshot of 10 years of two stocks uh, in terms of their uh, their overall uh, growth in price. Uh, the red line represents Red Hat, and the blue line represents Microsoft. And in 10 years, Red Hat stock has increased. You know, it's gone up and down, but it's increased 400 percent. Well, Microsoft stock has actually gone down about five, six percent, depending on uh, the latest uh, uh, stock market uh, results. Um, and what that's really saying is that the stock market itself uh, <coughs> is is betting on Linux. And one of the things that I, I would like you to consider about this point, whether or not you care about what Wall Street thinks, uh, but the, you should understand the way that Wall Street thinks. First of all, it's a herd mentality, and it's basically a big collective of people trying to uh, balance their uh, greed with their fear. Uh, but, but secondly, and more importantly, uh, the stock market is always betting on the future, right? Because when you put your money away, you want it to grow for the future so that you have it in your retirement or uh, to utilize for whatever for a future purpose you want. And so if you think of it, what the market is really telling us here in this example, and there are many more like this, is that the future that Wall Street sees is one of companies like Red Hat and definitely not companies like Microsoft. And for the Linux guys, uh, that is certainly great news. Um, it's great news in that I think the world has realized just how powerful the open source development method is, how powerful the way that uh, we license software is, how powerful the innovation that we all harness through this method uh, is, uh, and I think that that's uh, a really important uh, change. I think the only bad news from this chart is that uh, I don't have uh, as easy a time picking on Microsoft anymore. It's kind of like kicking a puppy, right? You know, I used to be able to come in and tell a couple of Microsoft jokes and you know uh, say Linux is great and be done. But now it's harder because you know those guys are really truly struggling, and it's uh, not as nice for me to pick on them. They're just too easy of a target. So we'll find other folks to, uh, to pick on. But I thought what I would do with you guys this morning is talk to you about why uh, I see the world turning to Linux, why companies from all over the world, um, governments and individuals tell me they're interested in Linux and why they're using Linux. And I thought that could give you some context into the work that's going on at KDE as you look at you know, how the, the PC desktop is changing, how uh, the mobile client is changing, and just, I guess, in general, uh, you know, a lot of what you guys do, from, from my perspective, and this is my opinion, is help people access technology in a rich and meaningful way. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to look at what kind of computing resources people are accessing, what kind of content they're accessing, how they're accessing it, and how all of that is changing. And then how that all fits together from both a technical perspective but then also from a financial perspective so that it can give you guys some things to think about as, as you're working on uh, KDE itself, which is just a, a terrific uh, effort. So why is the world changing uh, and turning to Linux? Well, it, it, and you know, some of this may sound like hyperbole and you know, I'm, I certainly wouldn't be, I certainly would be, it wouldn't be the first time uh, I would be accused of, of hyperbole, but we are really at an interesting turning point when it comes to uh, technology. Is this picking up, by the way? Are you yeah. hearing? Is yeah. everyone hearing me okay? Yeah. Great. I think we're, I think it's good. The radio pulled down. So. Did it fall? Yeah. 
<laughs> it's, you know, is it all wound, wound up in my... I could barely feed yeah. myself three days ago. Yeah. So <laughs> this is good. All right. we'll, we'll fix this thing afterwards here. Truly never overestimate how good of an athlete you are. I have to <laughs> tell you guys. Um, but so the, the first reason that I think people are turning to Linux, and you know, I, I, I want to just uh, say up front that when I say turning to Linux, we've all I, we've been doing this for decades, right? You know, most of you guys, and definitely me. Uh, and when I say why is the world turning to Linux now, is why are they turning to Linux in a meaningful way? in a massive market impacting global sort of revolutionary way where Linux isn't just a platform uh, that powers let's say a desktop or a server anymore where Linux is really becoming sort of an underpinning of almost all forms of computing. That, that's what I mean when I say the world is turning to Linux and you're going to see just how powerful that concept is and how important it is uh, as different forms of computing turn to Linux and it helps sort of cross-pollinate ideas maybe into your world that come from completely different and unexpected forms of computing on whether it's you know guys down at Petrobras in Brazil working on you know a particular form of Linux and they want to save power in their data centers and maybe that helps a Linux client save uh, battery life but when I say turning to Linux I say in a massive and important way for really everyone and I think one of the first reasons is that people are turning to it in this huge way now is because the internet itself is fundamentally changing. You know, today there are about 1.5 billion people who access the internet every day. This will probably double in the next year or two to about 3 billion people, uh, which is certainly a good thing. Um, but what's really different today about the internet is not that there's <coughs> two, three billion people connecting to the internet, uh, but that there are uh, soon going to be over a trillion devices connected to the internet. And those are things in cars or, you know, things that power uh, heating and cooling systems or monitor pipelines or manage traffic or herd livestock or you name it. Uh, but this, this internet of things, uh, which is, I think, a marketing slogan that a lot of companies uh, like to, to latch on to is significant in a couple of ways for Linux and I, beyond just the marketing phrase that I want to point out to you guys. Um, and, and the easiest way for me to think of it, and this actually comes from a, an example from a friend of mine at IBM, is to look at just how much this internet of connected things changes just one example of, of technology. If you look here, what, what I'm, I'm showing you is a power company that uh, is moving from a manual meter reading to a digital meter reader. And if you look at and think about how many transactions this uh, company, this is a company in the southwest of the United States that has uh, a million customers, so a relatively uh, small utility company. Uh, if you're manually reading your meter, or have, if you're literally sending someone out to actually read everybody's meter, you're engaged in about 12 million transactions uh, uh, per year. So, you know, you have a million customers, once a month you read the meter, you generate a bill, and essentially 12 million transactions are produced as a result. But as you can see, as you begin to digitize the meters at people's homes, and you start to use uh, the data that you're getting from these new connected meters, the transaction volume goes up significantly. If you're just reading it uh, once a day, you can see that it goes up to 0.36 million. But you know where the world really needs to get and will get, and I'm a firm believer that this will happen because it really will better people's lives, uh, is to get to a point where you're really getting data every 15 minutes and being able to get visibility into individual uh, power consumption patterns, be able to more effectively manage the grid, distribute power in a more uh, cost-effective way, and really reduce the overall uh, uh, consumption rate on, on a massive scale for people through that rich data that you're gathering, which 
uh, results in 35 billion transactions a year if you're reading that meter every 15 minutes. So I think you guys get the concept. I don't think the Internet of Things is a new concept to you guys, and I think this is an easy, uh, 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 albeit simplified, example to, uh, to define. But the, 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 the point I'm trying to make for you is, what does this mean for Linux, right? How does this tie into Linux? And it's really interesting when I talk to the different people in the industry who are providing solutions for companies like this, or to the companies themselves, is, is what they talk about uh, in terms of what it takes to actually handle this new increased transaction volume uh, and, and make sense of it. And so to deal with this Internet of Things, and I, again, we're just using the power example as, as, a, as a one example, but there are hundreds of examples. And I am lucky enough to be able to travel around the world to see many of these, and, and they almost all have similar traits to this, which is to deal with this transaction volume and to actually utilize this info, what you need is something to instrument uh, the uh, devices themselves, whether it's a meter or some kind of traffic management system that has sensors and things embedded within freeways or other uh, places, but you need to instrument uh, basically things. Uh, and what those are really are uh, small embedded systems that uh, collect uh, and report data back to some sort of central uh, data uh, warehouse where uh, you gather and store the data. And so to gather and store this data, you need uh, network servers, you need big ne uh, network storage systems and so forth. And again, I'm, I'm very, for anyone who's a CIO in the audience here, I'm very much simplifying your jobs. And you know, every time, when I, when I really talk to CIOs and people in big enterprise computing, they always get mad at me for oversimplifying. But I think this is, this is a better way to look at it. Uh, that it, so you, you gather and store all this stuff once it's been uh, reported through the instrumentation you put out. And then finally, once you've got this huge data warehouse of information, you need to make sense of it somehow. And this is you know, when I referred to Watson or some of these exotic supercomputing systems that are running on Linux now. This is really going to be an area that explodes in the, in the ne very near future, in fact, where rich analytics are becoming more and more important to society on a daily basis. And the deluge of data uh, really requires more innovation in this particular area in, in terms of the, not only the power of the systems that are able to uh, analyze this mountain of data, but also in the uh, software itself that actually can, you know, in an algorithmic way, you know, shape it into a form that's digestible by humans and can be uh, used to take action. So you need to sensor, uh, you put sensors and things, to instrument things, gather the data, analyze it, and then finally you need some way to display it. And when I, again, when I go around and talk to people, you know, a power company uh, these days are using ruggedized tablets, not necessarily their old desktop PC to uh, visualize this data and report it. Uh, I went to a, an oil company, which I won't mention their name, uh, they swore me to secrecy, but they have the most stellar visualization, I'll, I'll call it a wall, uh, this way that they're able to visualize the uh, sonar data that they gather uh, and, and crunch in their supercomputing systems. That's just spectacular. Uh, but it's, I can tell you that this, their visualization system, it's not a PC desktop, it's not running Windows, right? And so the point I'm making is that this future internet, if you look at it, embedded systems, network storage, enterprise servers, high performance computing, and mobile devices, things like tablets and so forth, new ways of visualizing data, it sounds pretty familiar to the areas where Linux is having a lot of success. It has less to do with just your traditional PC desktop and the Windows API. It's just a matter of fact that this particular way that the internet is shaping up and the way that data is being created, analyzed, and consumed actually favors areas where Linux is extremely strong. And I think that that's a powerful force, again, that we're at the very beginning of. And uh, we're going to see a huge amount of investment in Linux as a platform and all of the surrounding open source projects that make up a, a traditional you know, Linux operating system as well, which I want to 
you know, I'm not just talking about the Linux kernel here. I, I think as Linux itself is successful from kernel perspective, everything around it becomes successful as well. And I think we've seen that in a variety of ways. So the second reason that uh, Linux is becoming successful and adopted in a hugely meaningful way is one that I think is also fairly obvious to all of you, uh, is you know, just the fact that it's, uh, it saves people money. Uh, you know, it's freely available, it's very cost effective, it's incredibly reliable. Uh, I just heard a hilarious uh, statistic. Uh, Jim Whitehurst, the CEO of Red Hat, did a podcast, and he said something like, I think only a quarter of Red Hat's customers actually call for uh, a service uh, uh, ticket at any point. It's like a Maytag repairman for those of you from the US, right? It's just, there's nothing to do, the software is so reliable, which of course reduces costs and is an important factor. But the saving money thing, I think one of the things I want to point out to you guys, because I know you're interested in client computing, is what's going on in particular in the consumer electronics, mobile device, and PC industry relative to uh, their sort of money crunch. And uh, this actually comes from a, a, a book called Open Business Models, which I would encourage uh, any of you to read to give you some sort of context into how uh, open uh, source development and sort of collaborative innovation works. But uh, I, I like applying this model to what's going on uh, with Linux because I think it's just, again, you know, talking to uh, consumer electronic device makers, CEOs, and CTOs, and, and, and hearing what their troubles are, this really very accurately captures it. Uh, and, and what's happening is these guys have this uh, dual challenge uh, in the industry, where they are uh, getting a lot of pressure in terms of rising cost uh, to build a particular product these days combined with a, uh, a very big uh, pressure in terms of the amount of time they actually have to sell this stuff. And so what I mean by that is uh, if you look at uh, any kind of consumer electronic device uh, today, I mean, you, know, you guys are taking pictures or uh, you might have a uh, you know, smart television at home or uh, even in your car if you buy any you know, new model car these days, uh, the software experience in consumer devices really are defining these devices. Um, one thing I like to show is, uh, but I, I don't have time uh, to do today, is to show like the top 10 uh, smartphones that are on the market today as an example of just how important software is to a device. Uh, but show the top 10 smartphones with the screens blank. It, it, it just if you think about it in your head, they all look exactly alike. It, it, they're just, you know, it's a candy bar shape with a big blank screen, right? I mean, that's it. Until you turn it on, you really, there's, there's no difference between most of these uh, devices. Uh, although I'm sure that if there's people here from mobile device companies, they will all be adamant about how great this stuff is. But clearly, uh, and, and I don't discount that, I, I, I'm not a big believer in industrial design, but clearly software is where consumers are now perceiving, and in fact, the reality is that most of the value comes from that aspect of these devices. <laughs> and as software becomes more important, and it, it, it correspondingly has become much more sophisticated, uh, and all of you know how friggin' difficult it is to actually build a client <laughs> operating system. It's really friggin' hard, and it's really friggin' expensive, and it takes super smart people. Uh, and all of that is price pressure for all of these firms who are trying to create these rich software experiences in their device. So their cost is going up because the cost of software is going up significantly. Um, and the, the, the worst thing for these guys is not only is their cost going up because of this increased software expense, but now the amount of time they have to monetize their uh, investment in building client devices has shortened considerably. I, I think I throw my phone out like every six months, right? And, and I may be an anomaly, right? Because, you know, they, I get to see a lot of new phones and uh, I'm finicky as heck. And, uh, uh, but I, I would say that probably 12 to 18 months is the relative cycle of consumer devices. If you just think about how fast people are cycling through 
one generation of device to the next. It's, it's just breakneck, particularly breakneck when you put it in context of what the consumer device world used to be, where you'd have two, three years and something would still be reasonably up to date. Now you look at something that's three years old and you're just like, this is a piece of junk. That's how fast the semiconductor world is moving. That's how fast the whole device world is moving. So I got less time to make money, and the stuff I'm making costs more money to make. It's a big problem for the industry as a whole. And so by turning to uh, open source as a innovation model and a development model, the industry really solves uh, this, this problem in a fairly elegant way. Not necessarily elegant when you are looking at them in terms of you know how they fumble around with you know how to interact with the community or how to comply with licenses in an effective way. I think we see the industry kind of stumbling about in some some ways. I, I assure you they will get it right, uh, mainly because this is such a powerful thing for them in order to share this, the development of software collectively, even with their competitors, and that really means Linux these days, guys. I mean, it's just, it, it really boils down to Linux being, if you're going to do collaborative development in, in CE, Linux is the de facto platform for that. Just because of the availability of you know, device support, the fact that it runs in so many different kinds of chip architectures and so forth. So that shared development cost is incredibly powerful. But what's more powerful, and I'll show you later on how this uh, business world is changing, is the fact that you know, in the world of Windows or OS 10 or closed systems, uh, you know, you're really dependent on a third party for a lot of your monetization opportunities. But with Linux or open source, you know, you, you essentially own your platform and your destiny. And what that allows these companies to do is to make up for that shortfall in revenue uh, resulting from less time in the market with new forms of revenue from services such as maybe streaming music or application sales or so forth. Uh, and, and when I say new revenues, I give app stores and services revenue uh, a couple, of, just as a couple of examples. I think we're, again, we're at the beginning of business model innovation when it comes to Linux. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, subsidizing phones with a wireless data plan ain't the only business model to sell a brick and bone, right? I mean, there's other creative ways. I think mean, Amazon with their ebooks is kind of an example of where they took an existing business and came up with a way to monetize that in a different way. And, you know, I predict Kindles will be free soon enough. Uh, but I think you'll see other business models form around client devices that are uh, formulated for the healthcare industry or for other types of service opportunities that can really meet this uh, revenue gap that results from this very <coughs> competitive world of consumer electronics. So this, this is a critical way to think about why Linux is so compelling and important to the industry and why it will continue to be adopted in a huge and meaningful way. It's because it really is the only platform that allows you to solve these problems very, very effectively. So, by the way, um, how are we doing on time here? I just want to make sure I... 30 minutes. 30 minutes, great. Okay, so uh, I'm just completely off today. I usually am so good about keeping time. But um, the, the third reason why uh, I think people are turning to Linux, and again, I don't think this will be a surprise to you, but I want to kind of get you guys thinking, and then I, I hopefully will be able to spend some time uh, you know, answering questions for you guys, is we are really fundamentally changing personal computing as we know it. You know, for too long, the world has been dominated, in particular in personal computing, by essentially what was Bill Gates' vision of uh, a computer on every desktop running Microsoft Windows, you know. And you know, God bless the guy, he's given all his money away, and uh, it was a pretty darn good vision. Some of the things in between, uh, I don't agree with him uh, on at all. In fact, I was going to make a joke that uh, these two guys from Redmond showed up at my door to talk about their license first strategy, <laughs> which I refused to do and they broke my leg. <laughs> uh, but should I use that on Wednesday for our <laughs> All right, I'm going to use that. I'm going to agree with it. That's okay. So I tested my joke. <laughs> I just think that term is ridiculous. License first. Just 
be ret- I, all right, don't get me off. Uh, go on. Now. Let's, let's stick to the topic. Uh, we really are defining, redefining what a PC really is. You know, it, the PC is really changing. You know, is is a smartphone a wholesale PC desktop? Uh, are tablets, netbooks, net tops, whatever, smartbooks, whatever you want to call them, you know, is this the new big desktop? I mean, you know, if you read the papers that you, to leave all the industry hype right now, tablets are the big craze. I think tablets are very important, but I think definitely a lot of momentum uh, and hype these days around those. But, you know, is that really the desktop, right? Is the browser the desktop? You know, I think it's worth uh, asking. I, I, I have to say, and this is, you know, I, it's it, you never want to sort of personalize when you're looking at sort of broader market information. You hate to personalize it by saying, well, this is how I use my computer. But, I will say not only personally, but anecdotally, talking to a lot of people in big enterprises, most people in business uh, these days, uh, and I think this is a long-term trend that will take uh, a lot of time, but most people are accessing their computing resources and spending the majority of their day in a web browser. They're really, you know, you can't deny that, uh, you know, a lot of enterprise applications, a lot of the collaborative development tools that people use in enterprises every day uh, are just accessed through a, a browser. Uh, and, and I actually get the reason for uh, enterprises in particular to want to deploy applications through a browser because uh, back in the late 90s, I started a company called Corio, which was one of the early application <coughs> service providers. Does anybody know what an ASP, remember, remember ASPs? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Appli- All right, so a- ASP, long story short, was a term that we coined, which has been killed in favor of cloud computing or SaaS or whatever, but it was just an early iteration of essentially hosted software or software as a service. And our biggest problem in this company, we were hosting Oracle ERP applications and PeopleSoft and and other forms of ERP apps, was that we still were living in a client service architected world back then. And the cost of deploying client service applications on a hosted basis was a nightmare. Such a nightmare to maintain all these freaking clients. And uh, we really (coughs) loved the idea of sort of separating the presentation layer day layer in these enterprise apps in order to make them more economically viable to maintain and deploy across a wide variety of client hardware. So uh, that's why I think the browser is important and should be considered in a meaningful way in terms of what the nature of uh, of client computing is. I still think we got a ways to go before, you know, it's all browser all the time and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, so whether it's gaming or rich uh, uh, processor intensive applications, but you know we can kind of have that debate. But it's 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 definitely taken massively more importance across uh, the computing uh, and, and client world than it ever has before. In fact, just while I'm just on a bender about Microsoft, thinking about how they broke my leg, um, the <laughs> I just saw like two days ago where. Microsoft is now, when they talk about Internet Explorer 9, talking about how important it is to link the browser back to the operating system and how they've optimized IE 9 for Windows uh, 7, which I just find absurd, right? It's like, didn't we just go through that entire thing? Uh, And so keep an eye on the browser. Uh, It's really an important way in terms of, important thing to think about when defining client computer. But it's not just, you know, smart books or tablets or, or smartphones or browsers. Uh, you know, e-readers, digital picture frames, ways to connect to computing power that none of us have even thought of, I think are also important uh, in emerging as new ways and new forms of desktop computing. Certainly televisions are getting a whole heck of a lot uh, smarter. I'm not sure the 3D thing is really smarter, but, uh, you know, that's... We don't have to worry about that. I think that what is is uh, important is that <coughs> televisions are really now computers, and televisions are really now coming with sophisticated networked operating systems, most of which are Linux, by the way, which is good news for all of us. Uh, cars are also becoming a new important form of client computing. Uh, <coughs> an example of this is uh, this year um, Ford 
which unfortunately is using Microsoft Sync, uh, but uh, an important automaker nonetheless, uh, chose not to announce their newest line of the Ford Focus at the Detroit Auto Show, uh, which is the big auto industry event here in North America every year in January. They essentially skipped announcing their product there and instead announced their car at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas the second week of January. That is just such a great example of how the whole industry, the automotive industry itself, is really becoming a consumer electronics industry. And I talk to all these guys all the time, and they are obsessed with trying to figure out how to create really rich and interesting uh, automotive, you know, what they call IVI, in-vehicle infotainment systems. Uh, and some of the things that I've talked to these companies about, uh, by the way, Ford is the exception here. Most of these companies are producing their new IVI systems using Linux. Uh, in fact, there's an organization called the Geneva Alliance, which is made up of uh, car makers like uh, BMW and, and uh, GM and Peugeot and, and all, basically everybody else. Uh, are all using Linux to create these systems. But I mean, you're going to see cars that have hundreds of sensors in them, that have multiple, uh, you know, sort of networked computers within the car itself. And you can just, you know, your imagination just kind of goes wild with, you know, just how many interesting applications you could build for this sort of hyper network, hyper sensor, you know, in car computer system. So, uh, and I think that's going to be, again, a meaningful part of how people access technology uh, in terms of client computing. So uh, again, you know, just an example of where it's changing. A, a chart to sort of show you guys just what, how big this is in terms of this changing nature from the, the PC sort of desktop internet to this mobile uh, and sort of broad set of clients is just to look at where all the unit growth is. Excuse me, this, this medication is killing me. Uh, where all this unit growth is coming from. Um, you know, I think that Intel, for the first time, sold more consumer processors than they sold enterprise processors. I mean, into each of those markets, their sales in the consumer market was bigger than the enterprise market for the first time uh, last year. Huge change. And you just look at, you know, all of this huge growth. And it's not just, you know, x86. It's ARM, it's MIPS, it's all these other architectures which, you know, essentially natively support Linux. You go to any ARM uh, licensee, you go to any you know, MIPS, whoever, these guys now, they're basically bringing up their boards for the first time and testing and prototyping all this stuff, creating their, their initial BSPs uh, with Linux. That's just, that's incredibly good for Linux. I can't tell you guys how great that is to just have that sort of off-the-shelf BSP support and all these different architectures. And it's manifesting itself in all these things. You know, home entertainment, games, wireless home appliances, tablets, you know, MP3s, and so forth. And so this is really where we're seeing all this huge growth. And fortunately, you know, Linux really is this, uh, again, market leader in terms of adoption in this industry. And again, I want to emphasize to you guys, I tend to get an early view into these markets because I'm talking in these supply chains and with different types of people and the technology and business side and, and you know I, I think the semiconductor industry is probably a good leading uh, indication of just how favorable this world is for Linux because you know again I I, I talk to guys in the, in the semiconductor industry and uh, first of all they'll call me up and say you got anybody I can hire then the Linux people that I can hire then they'll call me back and say do you know how many companies I could acquire just to Yet Linux down. <laughs> uh, they're, they're investing in just a massive, massive way. I mean, Qualcomm just joined the Linux Foundation Board of Directors. They have hundreds of people working on Linux. Uh, the ARM, uh, many of the ARM licensees uh, put together a group called Lunara, which is a multi million dollar investment that uh, uh, they're saying is, is focused primarily on upstream development. Uh, we worked with them very uh, hard to show them how, you know, they can get their architecture as well supported uh, as as x86, which is sort of you know, the incumbent architecture for Linux, mainly because you know it's just it's what we all had, right? I mean, it's not that either architecture is better; it's just what we all had. And uh, to their credit, they're doing a good job of enabling that work. 
And that what that does is it provides those base building blocks for the company or the person that's going to create that next iPhone or that next breakthrough device that none of us has thought of. Uh, that that's really where those building blocks to create that device are going to come from. Uh, and so that's just wonderful news for Linux, just terrific news for Linux, uh, in particular in Linux as a client. And then I think the, the fourth major reason why Linux is being adopted in a major and meaningful way is because the entire IT industry itself really is moving to a services economy. And when I say moving to a services economy, I mean not just in, you know, this you know, wireless data plans subsidizing cheap Linux phones. I just think that's you know one example. I mean that that is an example where you can pretty much get a free phone these days if you sign up for a services contract. But it's this idea of moving to services it, it, for the IT industry is much much bigger. And what I mean by that is uh, the world of enterprise computing is also moving to a services economy. And Silicon Valley, you know, and uh, where I live, and you know, I actually live here in San Francisco, but I'm, you know, so close to Silicon Valley, and you know, most of my career has been here, is again an early example of where this trend is headed, where if you're a smart startup these days, you don't buy any software. I mean, seriously, it's all built on open source. If you look at any, like, startup these days, they're pretty much all using open source to build their company, which is a huge relief to them because it, used to be by all the software was really expensive and a pain in the butt to work with. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. But what's more interesting is they're not buying any hardware either. They're just, you know, taking up virtual instances on Amazon's cloud or in Rackspace or wherever and just, you know, building their company that way. So they're essentially free software and free hardware, right? I mean, obviously you pay for a service fee for that. And, and that's where I think <laughs> where we're headed towards. It's not just going to be software that's going to be free. Hardware is going to be free. Uh, and uh, does anybody here work at a hardware company? You're screwed. <laughs> 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 you will just sell your hardware to different people. It's not going to be. It's not going to be free that way. Uh, but. I think what you'll see is that there'll be very different uh, businesses that are centered around services to consume hardware. And so, you know, getting a free laptop with a wireless data plan is one example of that. But you can see where all of these in the consumer world, a lot of the new revenue in the IT industry is really being created around services. You know, uh, I really, if you look at the way that the the Kindle, as one example, has been trending, which is also Linux-based, just to get the extra plug in there. Uh, <laughs> Kindles, if they stay on their current price trajectory, are going to be free by the end of this year, uh, which I think is probably pretty reasonable. Uh, I think that you know, it's just an example of where the hardware matters less to Amazon than the ability to get people to purchase books and have an ongoing services relationship with Amazon. And I think that's just going to happen everywhere. Uh, in the industry, again, both in the consumer side, but also in the enterprise in terms of uh, cloud computing or things like uh, software as a service like Salesforce.com or so forth. Uh, I think the uh, easiest way to think about this is to just ask this question, you know, could Google be the company they are today if they'd used .NET to build Google search? I mean, just I mean, it's, it's, it's a sort of funny question, but it may not have been out of the, the realm of possibility back then when those guys were thinking about what to use. Um, but it's, it is absurd uh, these days. Really, open source and Linux are really the de facto platform in this services world. And I, again, I know this so well because when I look at uh, the, the company that I started, which went public in two, the summer of 2000, Unfortunately for me, any of you remember the timing uh, then. Uh, but it, our number one risk statement in our S1 when we filed for a public uh, offering was we don't own the software we host. You know, I mean, we're dependent on this other third entity to do this. So this is just why it's open source and Linux are so compelling in that in that services space as the industry moves to this. Um, and so, you know. It's pretty darn good news for people within the Linux community if you look at 
these big major trends, the need for economic efficiency, the changing nature of the PC client, the move towards services and this internet of things, you know, these things are really coming together in this, this great way to really benefit Linux. And my prediction for Linux is that, you know, we really are going to, and I, and I can say this with a straight face, I'm, I'm not joking around, we really are eclipsing in, in such a cool sort of way where self-forming communities are coming together and going apart and forming and reforming and all these different aspects of computing around Linux uh, in such a powerful way that it makes Bill Gates' vision of you know, a PC on every desktop running Windows look almost small. Where the Linux vision, enabled by all these incredible self-forming communities, is to make Linux and open source a fundamental component of the fabric of computing, of every aspect of computing, over very, very long periods of time, jumping from one segment of computing you know, to another segment of computing that may be completely different from embedded to high performance, to server, to mobile, uh, and that's never been done. That's just an incredibly fascinating and powerful concept for Linux, uh, and I think is going to cause Linux to be this underlying fabric of computing for very, very, very long periods of time, which is just terrific. And bodes well for all of you in terms of focusing in this area uh, from a career perspective, from a just a, from a fun perspective in that, you'll be able to work on just more interesting and fun things uh, over time throughout your career. So it's, it's really, really good. The final thought I want to leave you with is just how finances in the technology industry are also changing related to operating system software and what you know we need to kind of look at and, and show to folks uh, and remind them how important this is. In, in a typical, this is the old world of the, the, the PC, where you know essentially you had an operating system, which was Windows, you know, for the majority of users. Uh, Windows was loaded onto devices made by companies. They paid a royalty to Microsoft for Windows itself. Uh, the devices were then sold to consumers. The cost of the OS was passed through to the consumer. And then application and content providers, ISVs, who created you know applications for Windows or whatever platform, sort of got a free ride, right? They could just sort of use the API to you know make whatever they wanted, and they could sell those directly to consumers. They could bundle them in device makers. They could try and get Microsoft to bundle them with uh, Windows, or, or, or would get purchased by uh, with Microsoft or whatever. And that's kind of how it used to look like. And that has changed pretty significantly in the last uh, four or five years, where, uh, you know, app, first of all, application and content providers are no longer getting a free ride. I, I used to tell this joke like th three years ago, I think, when the Apple App Store first came out, where I said, you know, imagine if Windows, if Microsoft came out tomorrow and said, we are going to charge a 30% royalty on the gross revenue of every single application sold on the Windows platform. It would be a humongously important uh, announcement that Microsoft, that people would be like buying Microsoft stock, selling Adobe stock, which I guess they're selling both these days, but it's a side issue. Um, but it, it was just kind of amazing to think about. But that's kind of where we're at. If you really look at what Apple's doing, and, what Windows aspires to do and what other platforms there. Everybody wants an app store, everybody takes 30% off the top. That's not net revenue, that's gross. It's uh, a big cut. Uh, and you could argue that you know they're providing value through being a channel to consumers and providing marketing mechanism. Uh, I'll leave that argument to academics, but what I'll point out is that's a real amount of money and it's a significant change in the value chain for uh, software, in particular platform software. And so what you're seeing here is just, you know, the OS platform able to sell applications and services directly to consumers, to charge application and content providers, to offer them on their platform, to be a gatekeeper for that. Device makers still pay royalties to, to Microsoft if, if they're using Microsoft. Apple obviously owns a lot of this value chain themselves. There's a new player in town, which are really network operators, which now subsidize the devices. 
uh, and um, you know will enable a device maker to offer a free laptop or a free smartphone and so forth. Uh, and the network operators in turn sell their services and, and so forth. And uh, you know the picture not only looks uh, vastly different, but if you're a device maker, it's pretty freaking grim because you don't get any of this, right? I mean, you're like, you don't get to get any app store royalties if you don't own the operating system. And if you're bundling Windows on your device, Microsoft's going to get that revenue, right? Google, I think, shares some of it with device makers, but Google ultimately controls it. Uh, and you know, I think you'll see people sort of morphing around percentages and so forth, but these are uh, clearly linchpin places that people lie in the value chain in terms of who supplies the operating system software or not. Uh, and so, you know, if you're a device maker, you're looking at this and saying, like, I'm, I'm just back in the same business I've always been in, which is sort of my cutthroat, lar low margin device business, and I'm not getting any of this new pie. In fact, things are getting worse for me, as I previously pointed out, with the increased cost of building a device and the uh, shorter time that they're available in the market. And what this is, it, what's interesting here is this is really the closed set of economics uh, if, if you look at it in this new world. And what's great, if people are thinking straight from a business perspective, is this how much Linux can increase the, the amount of revenue opportunities for uh, people like device makers or network operators within this uh, value chain. And again, I've simplified the value chain, but I think you get the point. You know, If you use Linux, you're not paying royalties. You own the software, which means you own your platform, which means you can set up your own application stores or services and so forth and really control your own uh, destiny. And there really is no other platform that allows you to do that unless you build the thing from scratch yourself, which uh, I, I just I, I really don't talk to many uh, devices <coughs> these days who are wholesale going out and building their own operating system. I mean, it's just, uh, you guys know how hard that is and nobody's really looking. And they feel that there's plenty of opportunity to use Linux and other open source software components to really differentiate and build this. And so this is really favoring Linux again. And, and I think that we're again at the beginning of people thinking of business models within this new value chain. Uh, and. You know, I, I, right now we see a lot about Android and Apple, and you know, there's uh, you know, Microsoft is really trying to keep plugging away there. But I think this is still a wide open playing field, and we're going to see lots of uh, new types of platforms and service offerings and creative things coming out. And uh, fortunately, because of all these compelling reasons I've already pointed out, most of those will be uh, based on, on Linux. Uh, which is, again, just thoroughly terrific for all of us who really care about the quality of technology, the number of people at the coding party, the, the wonderful sharing of innovation. Uh, it's just terrific. And so, you know, in, 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 in closing, I would say that uh, for me, if I look back, you know, the last couple of decades, it's amazing to think of how far we've come from it was essentially a hobbyist movement uh, when Linus first started to really a, a professionalized, just, you know, world-changing phenomena that uh, affects everybody's lives every single day in modern society. There's not a single person in the modern world that doesn't touch Linux in some way every single day. Uh, and that is just true. And uh, you know, I'm excited to see industry adoption on a wholesale massive scale. I think industry is going to, to have fits and starts in terms of how they interact in these projects or how they host certain projects or how they uh, do certain things around it. But um, I think they'll come around. I think they'll get it. Um, the, the final thought I guess I would leave you with as we enter this world of just mass monetization and utilization of Linux and open source software uh, in the world is that, you know, I used to get this question all the time from the industry, uh, which was, can you teach us how to uh, give back to the community in a more effective way? They see, it was funny, like, so, so many companies, well, you would surprise me, right, that they would have heartburn over this, since they are, of course, evil companies. 
uh, but they they would they would ask me this all the time, and I used to you know I I used to have kind of this answer that I always give is okay well you know here's how you start getting influence within these projects, and you know you have to have your people committed to the, for the long term in these things, you know you don't. Uh, you don't throw stuff over the wall. You kind of are working in incremental steps, and you know, all these sort of things that you guys get. Are, I don't need to explain to you the best practice of working in open source project. But what I've lately been saying is, I, just, I don't even care. Just use the software, because what happens is once industry starts really using this stuff in a meaningful way, they always give back over time. They they can't afford to do otherwise. What ends up happening is they get start using Linux to save, you know, time and money and get tap into that great innovation. And what they quickly realize is that if they maintain their own fork of all these different software components, they have defeated the entire purpose of why they start using the software in the first place. And they start to really get that. And that's why you see lately so many more uh, drivers being supported. That's why you see even you know Broadcom <coughs> coming out and, and you know open sourcing stuff. And, uh, you know they eventually figure this out, and uh, the business case is very 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 compelling. So we're kind of beyond that need to evangelize. You know you need to give back and stuff because they always uh, always will end up needing to do so. I think we just need to make sure that there's a constructive way to bring them in as quickly as possible so that they can be productive within community development and that uh, firms understand these long-term commitments and, and you know how important it is to you know really stick with uh, these core projects over long periods of time of which KD is obviously a critical and, uh, and important project so uh, I have about five uh, maybe ten more minutes left and I can answer any questions uh, but I want to thank you all for uh, Putting up with my narcotic filled rant today. <laughs> <laughs> We've got five minutes. Uh, Frank, you were quick. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but thanks for the great presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank I especially you. like your slide about uh, the revenue stream between the App Store and hardware manufacturers and so on. That's very interesting, and I completely share your and your opinion. Right. It absolutely makes sense for, for manufacturers to use a free uh, Linux-based operating system. Um, and um, what's your opinion about the recent move from Nokia that moved from a free Linux-based system to a closed one, Windows Phone 7? Who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Never even heard of that comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, Last time I checked, I was not that small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they, uh, Nokia felt, uh, Nokia did what they felt they needed to do. I don't agree with it, um, but uh, you know, companies do what they think is in their best interest at, for whatever reasons they do, and I, I don't, you know, have any particular insight into doing it. Uh, what I what I can say about the Vigo project, which Nokia will continue to support, uh, they will uh, release a product uh, based on Vigo, uh, and uh, you know, continue to be active in the development process, albeit in a smaller way than they. Had previously been uh, participating in is if I look at things like Nego, these things tend to ebb and flow. Um, I don't think that I can predict whether or not that decision from Nokia will meaningfully affect Nego at all. It, it, it may even have a consequence of actually helping Nego in terms of. You know, other folks coming out of the woodwork to support the project that may not have because maybe they were too intimidated by Nokia. Uh, but uh, it's so hard for me because I've been in Linux a long time and you know tried to predict you know which version of Linux, which desktop's going to win, which runtime. You know, I just I, it's so hard to <coughs> see this stuff, right? That uh, I think that you will see that project produce incredibly meaningful code that will benefit Linux for long periods of time. Intel is completely committed. Uh, I think you're going to see over the next few weeks some maybe surprising announcements about other people participating that you might uh, 